Okay, thank you guys all for coming today. Um, so just to give you guys a little bit of background about our program, um, I am from the University of Michigan, like he mentioned, um, and if you are familiar at all with our program, we have a pretty huge rabbit program. Um, we average around 400 rabbits at any given time. Um, this number can fluctuate greatly. We've had as many as 75 kits born in a single day. Um, so this number, as you can imagine, goes up and down quite a bit. Um, we do have a pretty substantial breeding colony. Uh, we do have a transgenic breeding colony, a Watanabe breeding colony, an immunocompromised biobubble breeding colony, um, and that's just our breeding colony. We also do quite a bit of non-breeding rabbit work as well, um, just to give you some background on what we do with our research rabbits here. Um, we do have Dutch Belteds as well as our New Zealand Whites. Um, I'm mainly focusing on our New Zealand Whites, but everything I talk about today is also applicable to our Dutch Belteds as well. Um, so what I do there is I'm the social housing coordinator. Um, I do this for all, all, all of our social species, um, but today I will be focusing on our rabbits. Um, so I facilitate all of our rabbit social introductions and uh, mitigate any behavioral issues that we're seeing in any of our rabbits um, across um, any of our buildings on campus, um, which if you're familiar with our Ann Arbor campus at all, you know that it is very widespread. It is, um, across a very big area. Um, so I feel like I spend most of my time on buses, kind of going between buildings a lot of the time with a, a rabbit problem here, a rabbit problem there. Um, so I mitigate a lot of these different behavioral problems between rabbits. Um, and then I also train staff on any beha rabbit behavioral issues that come up. So in 2017, we underwent a big rabbit training um, across campus. So I trained the entire husbandry and veterinary staff on all species typical rabbit behaviors. Um, so my main goal is to really have our rabbit behavioral program equal to our primate behavioral program. Um, and I think this is really key in any facility that has a large rabbit program to really have your behavioral management program be equal to that of your primate behavioral program. So just an overview of how we're gonna kind of structure the talk today. Um, first up, we're gonna talk about, oh, you can't really see it, sorry. A light gray, but that's okay. Um, first up, we're gonna talk about how their wild counterparts live um, to kind of get an idea of what things are, how their um, things are done in the wild for these guys. So to do that, we're gonna talk about their natural history and then uh, the conserved behaviors when we bring these guys into the laboratory. So to do that, first we're gonna talk about the natural history. To do that, we first need to understand whose natural history we're talking about. So this is really important. Um, the Eastern Cottontail, the Silvolagus floridanus, is what we typically see here in America, um, especially up in Michigan where I'm from. These are what we usually see in our backyard, these Eastern Cottontails. Um, it's really important to note that while these guys look really similar, to the European rabbit, these are not at all the same rabbit. Um, they have a completely different genus. These are a very different rabbit. Um, they look vaguely similar, they're not the same rabbit. Um, so this can be really confusing to a lot of our investigators who will ask us, why are you trying to socially house our laboratory rabbits when the rabbits that I see in my backyard are never together? They're always solitary, they're not living in pairs, why are you trying to socially house our rabbits? Um, so it's really important to explain to them that we cannot compare these rabbits. They're a completely different rabbit. Um, and what's really important is that the European rabbit, the Erectolagus caniculus, is the ancestor to our New Zealand white, which is our laboratory rabbit. Um, so they have some really important distinctions. The uh, Silvolagus is a solitary rabbit. They're a territorial rabbit, and they don't burrow at all. Well, the Erectolagus, which is, of course, our... Um, the ancestors to our laboratory rabbits. These guys are social species. This is really important, they are a social species. They live in these really complex warrens with multiple entrances and exits. Um, they burrow. Um, so this is what you're gonna see in a wild European rabbit. You can see these complex um, social structures. They have multiple males, multiple females. Um, they dig these great underground burrows, so these warrens. You can see they have multiple entrances and exits. Um, it's a much more complex structure, a complex hierarchy than you're ever gonna see in the rabbits that we have in our backyard. Um, they're a crepuscular species, which means that they're much more active at dawn and at dusk. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, sorry about that. Um, so they're active at dawn and at dusk, um, and they spend much of their time budget grazing and browsing. So while it's really important to understand the social behaviors of these, their wild counterparts, um, it's really only important to understand these behaviors if those social behaviors are conserved when we bring them into the laboratory. So it's really important to know, are these social behaviors actually conserved in our lab rabbits that we have you know, in research. So there's been a few really great uh, studies done that have shown that domesticated rabbits actually do retain the social behavioral repertoire of their wild ancestors. So this is really key. It shows us that these behaviors are actually brought into our laboratory rabbits. So this is really significant. Um, I really like this quote. It says that both wild and domestic adult rabbits spend a considerable part of their time in pairs or in groups of three and voluntarily were in body contact between six 65% and 80% of the time. Um, so these two studies have used their, um, they've used their social behavior and the fact that they chose to spend their time in body contact with each other to show that these wild behaviors were conserved when they brought them into a laboratory setting. So this is really significant. Okay, so the next question that we're gonna answer is why are we actually trying to socially house these guys? So to do that, we're gonna look at regulations and the rabbit preference. So there's been a really big push um, towards regula uh, regulatory requirements to socially house, which we all know, um, which is great. I think all of us in this room are in a fan of that. Um, we support that, which is great. Um, so the guide, ALAC and OLA, all support that socially animals should be socially housed when possible, which is great. Um, and that single housing should be the exception, not the rule, and must be adequately justified. Of course, with anything, there's always gonna be some social housing exceptions to the rule. Um, I think the really important thing here and the key word is that these things should be reviewed routinely by IACOC and the veterinary staff. So routinely is the really important thing here. We should not be making these statements that, oh, we have this justification and just leaving it forever and saying we have a justification and leave it alone and never look at it again. These things need to be routinely reviewed. Um, I think that's really, really key and really important. Um, so some reasons that these things can be justified would be scientific justification, of course, uh, veterinary concerns for the animal's welfare, and then the thing that comes up most often in rabbits, especially adult male rabbits, is gonna be social incompatibility. Um, another really important thing, um, especially in terms of rabbits, is that this should not be a blanket statement. Um, sometimes people will say, rabbits don't get along. That that shouldn't be acceptable. That shouldn't be a justification. Um, you can't just make a blanket statement like that and say, oh, rabbits don't get along, so that's my exception to the rule. No, that's not really acceptable. Um, you need to provide a little bit more justification than that. Um, and we're learning so much every day about behavior and different methods of um, care and different methods of maintenance and new things are being published and new studies are being done. So it's really, really key that these justifications are being reviewed routinely by your veterinary staff and by your IACUC to make sure that these justifications are still applicable. Okay, and then moving on past the um, regulations, what do the rabbits actually want? Um, luckily, there's been some really great studies that have shown us what the rabbits actually want. Um, so there was this one that was really interesting um, that showed us what female rabbits prefer. Um, and they set up this really interesting cage um, that allowed the female to go into these different types of cages. And it showed that the female rabbits actually preferred um, she worked almost as hard for social, limited social contact as she did for food. Um, so that shows that she puts a huge value on this limited social contact. Um, as we know, food is a huge source of motivation for animals. Um, and she worked almost as hard to get this very limited social contact as she did for food. Um, so obviously, she really prefers to be near another female rabbit. Um, so this is a really significant study. Some other studies have um, also been done that shown that females in a laboratory setting spend up to 79% of their time in close proximity. They spent up to 58% of their time in total body contact with another female rabbit. And they prefer to be in the same cage as another female. 
Um, so these are all really significant ways that the rabbits have shown us what they prefer. Um, and I, I really think that we should listen as much as we can to what the rabbits are showing us and what they're telling us. Um, so a lot of times people will say, okay, so that's what the females want, but what about males? Because a lot of people think males do not get along. They don't want to be with each other. Um, and in the wild, as we know, males will compete aggressively uh, for territory. However, when you think about males in the wild, they, do, they don't live in a system where it's just one male. They live in a system where there's a dominant male and then there's several subordinate males. So they're used to being multiple males in a system um, and they're accustomed to that. So this was a really interesting study done in 2010 where they set up um, traditional style caging and then they had these modified cages where the males could be in isolation or they could have this social access um, quarter where they had um, these dividers that were clear and they had these perforations so that they could have some limited contact with another male. Um, so they could, even though they were still divided, they could touch each other through the panels, they could smell each other, they could kind of touch ears and noses. Um, and they found that males that had these social access panels spent more time in that social access corner. So they chose to spend more time near those other males. They were more active. They had normalized their physiological rhythms. They actually found that they synced their circadian rhythms. Um, and they were less fearful of unfamiliar humans. They found this by doing latency to approach tests. Um, and they think that this was due to social buffering effects of having that conspecific there with them. Um, so this was also really significant, especially in male rabbits. Um, so not only do female rabbits prefer to have another female there, but males have shown us that they even prefer to have another male there. So the next thing we're going to look at is, um, is social housing actually good for rabbits? So we're going to look at the benefits of social housing and then on the flip side of that, some of the detriments of social isolation. So there are so, so many benefits of social housing. This is just a teeny tiny snapshot of some of what I think are some of the more significant benefits of social housing. Um, if you're interested though, there's tons and tons of literature. Um, looking at the benefits of social housing. This is a very, very small list. Um, but some of the more significant ones is it can provide a really great social buffering against stress, which as we know in our laboratory animals, um, stress can be a really significant issue. Um, so anything that provides social buffering against that can be really significant. Um, social housing provides the perfect enrichment because it's dynamic, it's interactive, it's ever-changing. Um, it, something that we can't provide by giving them a toy. You know, this is something that's always changing by giving them a partner, it's the perfect enrichment. Um, it can reduce anxiety, boredom, and frustration, which we know is important to prevent stereotypies. Um, it can encourage activity, which as we know in our rabbits is really particularly important as they can develop things like gastric stasis and osteoporosis when they're in a um, cage setting. And it can normalize physiologic values, um, like we had talked about in the males, they had synced their circadian rhythms. Um, and when you think about things from a uh, researcher's perspective, think about how significant that can be if all your animals on study have normalized their physiologic values. That can be really beneficial to your research outcomes. And then on the flip side of that, there are also, this is once again just a tiny snapshot of all of the very significant detriments of social isolation in a social species. Um, thinking about this not only from the cost to the welfare of the animals, which is extremely significant, but think about it again from the welfare, or not the welfare, but from the perspective of the researcher. Um, these things can all have really, really significant effects on their research outcomes which can lead to them perhaps having not as good a research outcomes as they expected, and maybe they need to repeat some experiments, which maybe they're gonna need to order more animals, and the more animals are gonna need to be bred, and so it's just gonna be kind of a vicious cycle. So you can see how social isolation can really lead to more problems than we even are anticipating. Um, so it can interfere with brain and behavioral development. It can increase oxidative stress. It can increase heart rate, higher white blood cell counts, higher chances of disease progression, increased time spent in abnormal behaviors or time inactive. Um, and it can dis they can lead to um, signs of chronic stress, which as we know are signs of poor welfare. Um, so these are all really, really significant things that we do not ever want to see in any of our animal species. 
some signs of chronic stress that we particularly tend to see in our rabbits um, that are socially isolated are improper grooming. Um, so this can be no grooming or excessive grooming, like uh, over barbering or fur plucking. Um, a lot of times in our older singly housed males, we'll see inappropriate urine spraying, where they'll just kind of cover themselves with the urine and they won't clean it off and they get really gross. Um, we'll see pacing and circling, metal chewing, scratching or digging. Uh, sometimes they'll scratch so much they'll rip their nails off. It's terrible. Um, we'll see aggressive interactions with their caretakers. As you know, rabbits are not a naturally aggressive species. So if you see them interacting aggressively with the caretaker, obviously something's very wrong. Okay, so the next thing we'll look at, so this, that kind of gave us a background of why we're doing this. So how do we actually create these new pairs? We know now that we want these guys to be socially housed. This is the best situation for them. How do we do this? At U of M, we have the luxury of having a breeding colony that creates a lot of our new pairs for us. Um, we do, however, order in a lot of new arrivals. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so how do we create new pairs from those? And then we also do have a lot of attrition females that we need to pair as well. Um, so we had to come up with methods for pair creation. Um, like I said, we do pair attrition females and we do pair new arrivals from the vendor. Um, so these, I'll go over some methods for pair creation. I will say it is much, much, much easier to pair directly from the vendor. So I greatly recommend if you receive rabbits from the vendor, pair them immediately from the vendor. Um, capitalizing on that stress bonding from the vendor makes it a million times easier. Um, our six, I don't have the exact number, but our success rate from doing that is in the high 90s. It's gonna make it so much easier for you if you pair them directly from the vendor. Um, the stress bonding just really puts it over the top. Um, just a couple disclaimers before we get started. We don't pair any unrelated males at this time. Um, we, we do pair males, um, but they are all related. Um, there are some ways to deal with that, which I'll talk about later. Um, and any of our maintenance behaviors that we'll talk about later um, are, relate to males as well. But when we talk about pairing, um, like attritions, we only pair related males. And then all of our pairing at U of M takes place in double wide caging. We don't do any group housing or anything like that, only because, like I said, we have such a large colony, we just don't have space for it. Um, so everything I'm talking about is in caging. Um, so I know a lot of people think that you actually can't pair in caging because of that limited space. Um, so you can, um, that it is possible. Uh, we use Allentown caging. I know you can definitely do it in other caging as well. That's just what we happen to use. Okay, so prior to pairing, um, make sure you use a clean neutral cage. We've tried scent swapping, we've tried um, swapping cages. Um, we didn't have good success with it. We've had great success with neutral cages, so I recommend always using a neutral clean cage. Um, make sure you provide two of everything. We never want to encourage any sort of resource guarding. Um, even if they share, which usually they do share, which is nice, um, don't force them to share, just give them two of everything just to be safe. So give them two hiding opportunities, two piles of hay, two feeders, two waterers, everything too. Um, and we do that throughout their entire life. Even if they're a perfect pair, they get along great, still give them two of everything. Never make them share if they don't want to. Um, and then make sure you always give them two, uh, um, a low value enrichment and a high value destructible when you're first pairing. And we'll go over the differences between those. Um, we, we do urine marking, um, so before you pair, you're gonna collect urine from a male rabbit. If you happen to have a dominant male, you're gonna wanna collect from him. Um, in the wild, the dominant males will mark the subordinates within their social group, so we're kinda capitalizing on that theory. Um, you'll know you'll have a dominant if, for example, you had to separate a male pair for fighting, use the aggressor within that group. Um, he's gonna be your dominant. If you don't know you have a dominant, you can use any male. If you don't have any males, try and work with an institution near you who may have a male, um, or contact someone, a pet store, someone nearby. There are some places online that sell urine. I haven't worked with them, so I, I can't 
I don't know how, you know, how accurate they are or how, if they work, but I know other people who have used them and have said they're fine. Um, we're looking into the validity of freeze thaw, if it works, you know, if we can maybe freeze it and ship it, but I don't know how that works so far, but I think your best bet would be to just try and contact an institution nearby and see if you can get some mail urine from them if you don't have any. Um, I know there are some places that actually you have ordered a male rabbit just to have at their institution to have urine and to kind of keep the peace. Um, if that's something that you're able to do, that's awesome and I highly recommend that. Um, so just, we just, it's really easy to collect the urine, just flip the liner underneath the day before so the plastic side is up, the urine will pool on top and just syringe it off. So when the rabbits come in from, okay. So when they come in from the vendor, just make sure you mark their ears. Um, I like to mark the very tips of their ears in blue so you can see it from across the room wherever you are. Um, Cause like um, I think you had mentioned in the previous talk, you don't want to stand right in front of them and watch them when they're doing their parry behavior. You want to make sure you're a little bit away. Um, and so when you mark the tips of their ears, you can stand across the room and you can still see who's who. And then you're gonna weigh each rabbit and do a nail trim. And then you're gonna urine mark each one. So you wanna use a generous amount of urine um, and just wipe it right in between their um, ears, eyes, like that. Um, just put a good amount on and then just put them right in the neutral cage together. And then you're gonna monitor them for at least 60 minutes. Um, so in this video here, you're gonna see circling. So this is a really important behavior. You're probably gonna see this in that first hour. What you'll note here is that both the rabbits were circling each other. So no one was trying to flee away. No one was submitting. They were both circling each other. So this is um, definitely a more aggressive behavior. Um, and then so all we had to do is we came in with a water spray bottle, we gave them each a little squirt, and they separated and went to their own side. This is typically what's gonna happen when you give them that little squirt of water. Um, we never use the water as a punishment, it's just a little distraction, and they don't like the being wet, that feeling, so they usually will go to their own side and groom off the water. 99% of the time, that's all it takes to distract them, is just that little squirt of water. Um, and this video, it had been cut off, but we actually, we let them circle like that for about 15, 15 to 30 seconds before we intervene. We don't do it right away when they start to circle. Um, but you can see, as soon as we sprayed them, they stopped. Um, so in that first 60 minutes, if you see that continuous chasing, circling behavior, if you see biting or clear fight behaviors, like that jousting or that lunging behavior, you'll see the rabbits where they kind of like both go at each other like that. Um, if you see that, that's when you're gonna intervene with that spray bottle. Um, and at that time, you can mark additional locations with that urine too, like their back, face, or rear. You can put a little extra on them. Are you marking both animals? Yes, you mark both. You only mark one with the color, so you know who's who, but you mark both with the urine, yes. These are both females, right? These are both females, correct. Um, during this first hour, you're gonna be recording every behavior that you see on this ethergram that we created. Um, since the majority of interactions, or of these aggressive interactions are seen during the first hour, we wanna record everything during this first hour. Um, you'll notice that this ethergram goes out to two hours. Um, that's because everything is animal dependent. So the minimum is an hour, but if after that first hour you don't feel comfortable, you're welcome to stay. We base everything based on that pair. As you know, every animal is different, every pair is different. So if you wanna stay longer, you stay longer. If you feel awesome after an hour and they're great, you can leave. Um, but the minimum is an hour. So some of the behaviors that you're probably gonna see during that first hour, the most common ones, other than normal rabbit maintenance behaviors, are gonna be mounting, chasing, nipping, fur plucks. Um, it's really, really, really important though that you don't intervene too quickly in that first hour. So this process of these highly ritualized dominant submission displays, these are essential to their hierarchy establishment. They have to go through these behaviors, especially when they're first meeting for that first time, they're first figuring out who's dominant and submissive, and if you go in and spray them every time they mount or spray them every time they circle, they're never gonna figure out who's dominant and who's submissive. They're never gonna figure out who's in charge and they're not gonna be able to establish that relationship. Um, so it's 
really key that you don't intervene unless you have to. Um, we try to not intervene unless we're really, really worried that someone's going to get injured. Um, you're kind of there as a last resort. You really want to let them work it out on their own. Um, and it's scary the first couple times until you're more comfortable with what they're working it out looks like. Because it looks pretty volatile and aggressive at first until you're more comfortable with what it looks like. So there's lots of successful and unsuccessful indicators um, during that social introduction. So some successful indicators are going to be clear dominance and submissive behaviors. These are what you want to see. Um, affiliative behaviors obviously are great to see, like grooming, eating, drinking, resting side by side. Um, some unsuccessful indicators are going to be both rabbits engaging and dominance <coughs> behaviors. Um, this is not usually a good sign. Uh, resource guarding and wounding, obviously not a great sign. Uh, but once again, we don't this isn't necessarily a bad sign. Um, if wounding is observed at any time, you want to make sure and train your technicians to contact the veterinary staff right away. But we only separate if the wounds are to the genitals, to the eyes, or they're actively bleeding. That's the only reason we're going to separate the pair. If there's like a superficial wound, if there's a fur pull, um, if there's little bites to the ears, you know, anything like that, we do not separate the pair for that. That doesn't warrant separation. Only genitals, eyes, or like an actively bleeding deep lesion, something that might need a suture, that's the only reason we separate. Okay, so after an hour, if they're resting, eating peacefully, they're not chasing anymore, then you can leave the room. They're probably okay. Um, we're going to do two additional 10-minute checks throughout the workday, and then if they're stable, you leave them overnight. And it's really, really scary that first night. Um, not going to lie, everybody's super nervous that first night. Um, it, it definitely is. And we always have one person that's like, oh, I'm just going to work late tonight. And they always stay and check on them. And it's totally normal. Um, and then we always have some person who comes in really early the next day, and that's fine. Um, but I will say we've never come in the next day to a major wounding. Never. Knock on wood. Hopefully we never will. But we've never had that happen. Um, and then the, the next morning, that's the only time when you're going to physically take the rabbits out and do a physical exam on them, just to be extra safe that nothing happened overnight. Um, you have to physically feel underneath the fur. We all know with rabbits that fur can hide so many of those little tiny lesions. So you want to physically feel underneath the fur, make sure you didn't miss any lesions, and then you have to physically check the genitals, because um, it's impossible to see any wounding there without actually checking. Um, and if they're fine, then they're great. We consider them pretty stable. Um, that's the only time you have to physically check them, though. Um, and then, of course, if you did find any wounding then, then you'd contact the veterinary staff. So for the next two days, you just do a 10-minute check on them in addition to their regular husbandry check. And then if everything's good, they're considered stable. And that's it. Um, I know it seems like we just breeze through that. We'll go through the behaviors that you're monitoring for, but it's really a lot more simple than it seems. What extent of the wounding would you permit them to say to be reappointed versus separating them from them? Only, like, so for the only things we separate for are if it's an eye wound, like, to the eyeball. Like, if it's a little scratch around the eye, that's fine. Um, and then same with the genitals. If there's like a little scratch around the genitals, that's fine. If there's actual genital wounding, then we call it. And then same with like a lesion. If it's a deep, like if they're going to need sutures, if they're going to, you know, analgesic, something like that, then we call it. But that's it. Any sort of superficial lesions, you know. A lot of times what we find too with these guys is they get more of their injuries from the initial introduction where they're chasing each other around the cage and they're kind of banging into things in the cage and they tend to like, they'll hit their nose on things and they'll, they get a lot of wounds from that more than actual like bite wounds. And you know how their, their skin is so papery, they'll get so many like fur pulls and it like tears their skin. They get so many wounds from that from social introduction as opposed to actual like aggression wounds. So that's why we don't want people to separate for minor wounding when it maybe didn't have anything to do with actual aggressive behaviors. Yeah? We did, and it wasn't very successful. I think getting them used to a bigger space and then putting them in a smaller space, yeah. I, just for our situation, it didn't work. Males, we do not. Females, we do. 
depending on the situation, if it was a female where, depending on why they had to be separated, if they were two dominants, we obviously wouldn't repair, we would repair with a submissive. Um, males, we don't ever repair, unfortunately. Yeah. Yes? Sometimes, yeah, um, we have a maintenance plan that we use to work through why we were having the breakdown, and usually we can identify why we had the breakdown, and then usually we can try and work it through. Yes, definitely. Yeah? How about differences in size of animals or uh, ages? Uh, what about it? Uh, do you commonly, if they're very different, pair them, or do you tend not to, or just run everything through the same scheme? We run them through the same scheme. We tried for a while. We were trying to kind of go off the primate scheme of like maybe a, a bigger one would do better with a, a smaller one. And we found that it wasn't quite the same. Um, yeah, so we're, tr we're trying, we've done some preliminary work with temperament testing. Um, and that's been a little bit more successful than just kind of doing the size things. Um, but yeah, it's, it seems to be almost a crapshoot really <laughs> with, you know, who's going to be, because we've had some where the little guy was, dominant and we've had some where the older big guy was dominant so it's who knows I'm, I'm gonna actually if you're gonna ask a question raise your hand so I can hand the microphone and that way everyone can hear you if that's all right hi um, you were saying that you repair both males and females after one of the pair is lost to attrition not males just females just the females yes. and is there a certain age uh, after which you wouldn't repair no, no. females will repair any age okay thanks. Yep. thanks sorry did you have a question thanks. do you have any concerns like a specific time period where if one rabbit is removed for a procedure or something and comes back, that you have to be careful with bringing the rabbit back? Yeah, we don't have a specific, like, I know some people have like one hour, two hour. We don't have a specific time range. Um, we're more cautious with males for sure. Um, what we do with males is we try and encourage the investigator to, if you're taking a male, take both males. And even if you just have to leave them in the room um, while you're doing the procedure, just leave them in the room. And then when you put the other male back, just keep them in the cage together and watch them until the other male is recovered, um, until he stays awake. And we've had a really good success rate with that actually. Um, and then with females, we try and encourage the same thing, um, but they tend to be a little easier so they've, they've done better with it. Um, yeah, that's, that's worked for us so far, just encouraging them to take them both has been pretty successful. But yeah, definitely with the males, if, if they don't take them both, if they take the males for more than a few hours, we usually call it. Um, definitely if it's more than like overnight, that's, we have to call it. Because the only time we've actually had a situation where um, we lost a male, due to fighting is they were separated overnight and so I'm putting them back together. And that's, we average 400 males, or 400 rabbits a year, tons and tons of pairs, and we've only lost one due to fighting, which you never wanna lose any, but I think those numbers are pretty good, we've only lost one, and it was that situation where someone, they had been separated overnight, someone put them back together, and it was that. So, you hate to lose any, but that was the situation, so. Anything else? Okay, I keep going. Okay, so we'll get into the ethergram behaviors now. Um, so understanding behavior, I think, is by far the most important part of this entire talk, this entire everything with rabbits. Um, for the longest time, oh, everything's so white up there, sorry, you can't really see it. Um, for the longest time, I think we didn't really understand rabbit behaviors, and we're still kind of trying to figure it out. Um, there was almost no literature for understanding laboratory rabbit behavior for the longest time, and even now there's very little. Um, and for the longest time, I think we treated them more like large mice. And now that we finally are starting to understand how complex they are, how complicated their social systems are, and their uh, hierarchies, we finally are starting to understand that they're not at all large mice. They're way more similar behaviorally to small primates. Um, and they, we need to have behavioral monitoring systems for them that are much more similar to our primate monitoring systems. Um, and I think I always encourage institutions to, if you have somebody who is really great with your primates and who really understands your primates, 
bring those people into your rabbit teams. Have those people train some of your rabbit people um, because they are going to understand your rabbit behavior a lot better than you think. Um, because a lot of our rabbits are really, really exhibiting behaviors that are really similar to the primates. Um, if you are trying to figure out your rabbit behavior, read some primate literature because it is remarkably similar. Um, Obviously, there are different species. Obviously, I know there's going to be a lot of differences, but there is a remarkable amount of similarities. Um, so it's really helpful when we're trying to figure all this stuff out because there's not a lot of literature out there. Going to the primate literature has been really helpful to try and figure this stuff out. Um, so this is a good, a really good, it gives us a good starting point to kind of jump off from is going to the primate literature. Um, and so I, I really encourage you when you go back to your facilities and go back to your rabbit programs to kind of think about that um, as you try and build your rabbit behavioral programs. Um, so to do this in our program, because we didn't know how rabbit behavioral behaviors worked really, um, so we recorded rabbits for hours and hours and hours to see what they were doing together, rabbit pairs. Um, and then we just watch these videos for hours and hours and hours to see what are they doing together. Um, and then based on these videos, we made this ethogram. Um, and so we were able to determine what behaviors were more positive, more neutral, more negative, and then what um, are more kind of communication behaviors. Um, and so doing that, that's how we created this ethogram. So the positive behaviors are reflected through these dominance, normal, or submission behaviors. Um, so dominance behaviors are going to be this chase um, and submit or chase and flee behaviors. So you can see this behavior is really different from that previous behavior we saw where you had to spray. This is going to be a chase flee behavior. This is not where both rabbits are chasing. One is chasing, one is fleeing. You have a very clear dominant and a very clear submissive in this behavior. Um, this behavior you are going to see all the time. This is a very normal behavior. Um, this is something that you might see every single day. In the wild, the dominant is going to require a submission, submission displays as often as every single day from their subordinates. So you might see something like this every single day, and this is totally okay. Um, this is a normal behavior, and this isn't something that you need to separate for. This isn't something that indicates aggression or pair breakdown. This is normal, so this is okay. Um, mounting and mountain behavior, this is also very normal, um, as long as you have a dominant and submissive, and the submissive is accepting being mounted, this is normal. Allo grooming, this is once again very normal. Um, we tend to see dominant grooming submissive, however we see it flip-flop quite a bit in submissive grooming dominant, and that's okay and doesn't indicate pair breakdown when they flip-flop, and that's totally fine. Um, thumping is a really interesting behavior because they do it for a lot of different reasons. Um, in this one, I don't think we have any sound, but I was in the room recording this one and it was incredibly loud. Um, this dominant, you can see she's standing up and she was just thumping repeatedly, very, very loudly at the subordinate. And you can see she's just staring down at her. She's not breaking eye contact. She's thumping repeatedly. And you can see the subordinate is just maintaining a, a low body posture. She's keeping her chin down. Um, you can clearly see who's dominant and who's subordinate. So even though it looks like a very intimidating, almost, a, almost aggressive behavior, um, it's a very clear submissive display. Um, it's a clear dominant and a clear submissive. So this is a really good behavior, actually. Are they pair housed with a divider? Or They're pair housed with no divider. Okay. Yeah, so these guys are together. Sorry, all of these guys are together. Sorry, if that's not clear from the pictures, they're all paired together. Um, so yeah, thumping, like I said, is a really interesting behavior because they can use it for multiple communication reasons. Um, They'll use it to assert dominance towards a subordinate, like in that video we just saw. Um, the submissive will use it sometimes when they're fleeing away, so it can be a subordinate behavior. Um, they can use it to alert the rest of the colony to a potential predator. Um, they can use it as excitement, like sometimes you'll notice if you go in the room and open the food bin, they might all start thumping. Um, they can use it as agitation, like if there's a loud noise, one might thump, and then the rest of the room will thump. So it's something that they use for a lot of different things. It's, um, I find it really interesting. Um, just make sure that when you're identifying it, that you're correctly identifying the motivation behind the thumping behavior, um, since they do use it for so many different things. Um, and on the ethogram, we do have it listed multiple times, and people always point it out like it's a typo. It's not a typo. Um, we do have it on there because they do it for multiple reasons. 
Um, so here's just another clear dominant submissive behavior. You can see the submissive was eating at the feeder. The dominant comes over. There's no aggression. There's no real resource guarding. She's not pushing him out of the way. Um, he just wants to eat at that feeder. The submissive moves away, and then the dominant can eat at that feeder. So it's a clear dominant and submissive, but it's not aggressive. It's not resource guarding. It's not hoarding. This is a, a, a positive behavior. Also, if they share resources, this is good. This is what we typically see, is they'll eat all their food out of one feeder and then move over and eat all their food out of the other feeder. This is great. Uh, we also treat self-grooming as a positive behavior um, because if you think about it, if she felt threatened or unsafe in her social group, um, she wouldn't take the time to groom herself. She certainly wouldn't put herself in this vulnerable position where she's kind of up on her haunches with her stomach exposed if she felt like she was going to be attacked by her uh, social partner. Um, but she's taking the time to groom herself. Her partner's right next to her. She doesn't feel threatened. Um, she feels safe in her situation. Um, so we treat this as a positive. Um, sharing space is a very positive thing. These are two adult males. These guys were about a year and a half when I took this video. Um, you can see they're pretty huge. Um, they're both so fat that really one of them can barely fit up on that shelf. Um, and they have both sides of this cage, so they do not need to share this perch. They can easily go to the other side of the cage, use the other perch. They're choosing to share this perch. They're clearly getting some value out of being next to each other. Um, whatever value that is, I don't know. Maybe they like it. They take comfort in, in each other. I don't know. But they're choosing to be next to each other because they want to. They don't have to be there. They don't have to share that space. They're choosing to. Um, so we treat this as a very positive interaction especially when you see this between two adult males who a lot of people think don't want to be together. Um, a lot of people will say, oh, rabbits might mutually tolerate each other and that's it. I don't see this as mutual tolerance, you know, because they don't have to be by each other. They're choosing to. Um, solo interaction with enrichment. This goes back a lot to our previous talk about play. Um, I think she looks pretty happy. <laughs> um, they. Obviously, she feels pretty safe and secure in her environment with her partner there. She's choosing to play with her toys. She feels happy. Um, she looks happy, at least. Um, she doesn't feel like she's going to be attacked by her partner. Um, she's being distracted from any sort of uh, negative behavior with her partner. Um, and anybody who has rabbits knows that they love those metal toys because they're super noisy. Um, even better is when we can see them dual interaction with their enrichment. Um, and like I said before, we always give them two of everything, so they do not have to share. They have two of these. This was just a stuffed tube with hay or something in it. They have two of these. They don't have to share. They're choosing to engage with us together. Um, and you can see they're not fighting over it. They're not trying to get it from each other. They're choosing to interact with it together. So this is really great. Um, this is why we like to give them interaction or enrichment. Um, that's something that they can do together that distracts them from any sort of negative behavior um, and encourages and fosters happy, fun play behavior. So this is a great thing. Um, one thing that we found with the ethogram that we were very surprised about was neutral behaviors. Um, if you see neutral behaviors, these are it's kind of hard to see, but they are each just on their own perch, just kind of doing their own thing. This can be nothing. It can mean just your rabbits don't want to interact. They're just kind of doing their own thing. However, if you have two rabbits that are consistently neutral, they are never interacting, they are always just doing their own thing. They, you never see any positive or negative interactions. These are the guys that tend to fight and tend to wound each other. Um, so what we think is that these guys have not worked out their dominance hierarchies. Um, and when they do try and figure it out, they are older and bigger and they tend to hurt each other. Um, so if you have a pair that is always consistently neutral, keep a really close eye on them because they are the ones that are probably going to hurt each other. Um, so just be really cautious. I'm not saying separate them. Just keep a close eye on them. Maybe give them a little extra enrichment, a little extra monitoring. Um, we were really surprised by this, but keep a close eye on these guys. Um, so next up, the negative behaviors. These are going to be reflected through your aggressive and your stressed behaviors. These are the ones that you don't want to see. Um, it's really important to remember, though, that just because your pair is displaying some of these negative indicators, it doesn't mean that your pair is going to fail. Um, you're going to increase your monitoring and enrichment, um, but it doesn't mean 
that just because you've seen a bite or a fight that you need to separate that pair. It doesn't mean that you have a bad pair or you have an aggressive rabbit or that this is, you know, this pair is doomed. Definitely um, don't separate unless separation is warranted based on, you know, one of those wounding categories that we talked about. Um, so this is just another one of those kind of circling behaviors like we saw earlier. Um, this one's a little bit more aggressive because you can see there's some biting, there's some nipping, and then they kind of turn around and the other one's doing the circling. But once again, you can see no one's trying to flee away. They're both circling here. And we just came in with a spray from a water bottle. And that was all they needed. It was just that little bit of distraction to kind of stop them in their tracks. And then if you watch as the video goes on, they're kind of like, whoa, what'd you just do? And then one mounts and the other submits. So this is a really good dominance behavior. So sometimes all you need to do is just kind of be that distracting force to kind of stop them. And that's great. Um, these guys are more difficult. The pairs that have difficulty establishing dominance, you want to keep a close eye out for these pairs. So at first, when you see this video, this looks like a nice pair. Seems like you have a good dominant and submissive, uh, but watch the girl on the bottom. Um, so it seems like you have a dominant who's doing some mounting, and she's also doing a little bit of aloe grooming there. Uh, your subordinate is accepting being groomed and mounted, but then you see her, she turns around and starts to nip a little, which is weird for a subordinate. They shouldn't really be doing that. Um, and then she's going to start to nip again a little bit, and it's, that's a weird behavior for a subordinate rabbit to do. And then she's going to do it a third time, and then if you watch her, she's going to actually turn around and chase the dominant. That is not proper subordinate behavior. Um, she is not okay with being a submissive rabbit. She does not want to be a submissive. Um, these are two dominant rabbits. So this pair is not going to work out, and they, they didn't work out. We had to separate them. Um, so something as simple as that and as nuanced as that can be a really clear indicator that you have two dominant rabbits, and they're not going to work out. So you really need to have staff that's trained in rabbit behavior. Yeah? Just, they're usually fine. Yeah, yeah, there's usually just not much going on. Sometimes they'll have little tiny scuffles, but there's usually not much of anything. Potentially, it's not as enriching. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, there's not as much wounding, so honestly, I'm not as concerned with it. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm, I'm more concerned when you have two dominants. How do you tell that pair then from the neutral pair that you have? Uh, two subordinates, you mean? You or two submissive? Pair. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, they don't wound. Yeah. Yes? So for that pair, you uh, marked them on your and then you didn't separate them. You kind of thought you were going to have an issue, and then you only separated them once they knew each other. No, yeah, that's a good question. No, we increased their monitoring and enrichment and kept an eye on them, and then once we saw a wounding, then we called it, yeah. This is another pair where they had difficulty establishing dominance, similar to the last pair. Um, so once again, at first it seems like you have a really clear pair, um, but if you watch the submissive's face again, um, you can see her really struggling to get away. She doesn't look happy. What's really interesting with this one, though, is watch her when she gets away. She doesn't run to the other side of the cage. She turns around and gets on top. So she's not scared. She's not hurt. She wants to be dominant. So she's going to turn around and get on top and try to be dominant. So clearly these girls are two dominants. Um, and these girls actually did, she got bit in the back when she was trying to get away. So we did have to separate these two right away. Um, and then these are communication behaviors that are totally normal behaviors, so we don't want to separate for these. Um, these are probably things you see all the time, urine marking, barbering, they're very normal. Um, but we found that if they go unchecked, they can proceed aggression. So we do intervene for these um, with enrichment, which we'll talk about. Um, but they're not aggressive, they're totally normal, so we don't want to... Um, treat them like aggression, but they can precede aggression. Um, so these are just urine marking, which we'll see in males and females, and barbering, which is normal, but if it proceeds to over-barbering, it can lead to lesions. Okay, so then how do we maintain these rabbit pairs? That's kind of what I think a lot of these questions have been about. How do we maintain these pairs? 
Okay, so we do a documentation monitoring and a two-step intervention approach. So sexual maturity begins somewhere between 12 and 17 weeks-ish um, with rabbits. And we did an internal study in 2015 and found that around half of negative interactions between, begin, between, begin between 10 to 20 weeks. Um, so because we know this, what we do is we keep track of the pair's ages. Um, so we just put a flag behind their cage card and then every week the technicians just update the week. Um, so that we can quickly enter a room and just kind of scan who's in that kind of danger zone, who we need to kind of keep an extra eye on, you know, who's in that 10 to 20 weeks. Um, and this is really helpful to kind of know just when you go in a room, you know, who might be having a little scuffle, who should I really take an extra look at, who should I spend an extra few minutes with, et cetera. Um, so, and we have these monitoring logs, these interaction and enrichment logs. Every single pair has one of these logs. Even if they're a perfect pair and they have no problems, they all have their own logs. Um, this is where we record everything in their history on this log. Um, every pair, no matter what, is monitored and documented for a minimum of one day a week for five to ten minutes. This is on top of their normal um, husbandry um, cage side daily checks. Um, and here, this is where we record any history of the pair, um, any interactions, any enrichment, all that kind of stuff. So the first step is when any negative or communication behaviors are noted, like those ones that we talked about before, we increase their enrichment to Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and we document their observation Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And then if any of those behaviors get worse, um, or if any new behaviors are seen, we increase our enrichment to daily and we document the observation to daily. And when I say daily, I mean daily. So that's weekends, holidays, every single day. And this isn't like, here's a ball on Monday, here's a ball on Tuesday. This is, we put in a new toy, we take out the old item. It's, um, we have different categories. The categories are rotated. Um, it is a pretty intense enrichment process. Um, it is on par with, I would say, most places primate enrichment process. Um, there is a rotation schedule. Um, it is pretty, pretty significant, I would say. And I think that is the key because novelty in rabbits is super, super important. Um, if we give them a toy and then give them another toy, it is essentially has no value. Um, so it's really key to keep them interested. Um, we did a study in 2016 that showed that um, their aggressive behaviors in pairs are severely lowered when they have um, enough enrichment. So it's really key. Um, so if any wounding occurs, of course, we notify veterinary staff immediately. But as we've said multiple times, I just want to make sure we reiterate, reiterate this, we do not separate the pair unless the wounding is on the genitals, the eyes, there's a deep puncture or an actively bleeding lesion. These are our only criteria for separating a pair. Um, this has been really key to keeping our pairs together and working through so many little issues. Um, so let's talk a little bit about our enrichment intervention. Um, so we have a six page rabbit enrichment database. So it's pretty thorough. Um, we have four different categories of enrichment and we have a full page approved foods list. Um, all, of, all of our rabbits do receive uh, hay daily and that includes weekends, holidays. Um, I do think it should be just standard as part of their daily diet, not necessarily a uh, form of enrichment. Um, we do rotate between the groups to maintain novelty. Um, so our enrichment groups are low value, high value. Our high value are destructibles as well as food treats. And then we also have supplemental enrichment. And we do autoclave all of our cardboard items prior to use just to um, prevent any spread of pathogens because most of our items we try and recycle from within the um, facility just to cut down on costs. So our low value enrichment are mostly going to be um, manipulanda type items. Uh, these are things that the rabbits enjoy, but they enjoy for a short time. Um, so these are going to be things like toys, cardboard in the cage door, wood blocks and wood chew sticks. So these are things that are fun, but they're only fun for, you know, a little while and then they're kind of over it. Um, so cardboard is playing good. Are kind of one of our text favorite things because they're really fast for the text to provide to them and it actually takes the rabbits 
quite a while to destroy them. Um, and our supervisors love them because it's free. Um, so we just take the liner boxes and cut them into strips and autoclave them. Um, and then they just roll them up and they stick them in the cage doors. And it takes the rabbits a little while to kind of pull them into the cage. And then it takes them a while to like dig them up and shred them. Um, and they seem to really enjoy it. And we've been giving these to them for at least five years now. And we've never had an issue with um, impactions from them ingesting them. So we do get that question a lot. We've never had that problem. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, our high value enrichment items, the destructibles, I'd say are probably everybody's favorite. Um, these are things like tubes, boxes, and bags that are stuffed with whatever you want. Hay, crinkle nests, treats, um, whatever you can think of. Everybody loves these. Um, if you have a really smart rabbit, you can compound these. You can put a tube stuffed in a box, stuffed in a bag. Um, be as creative as you want. Um, think about what you would use with a primate and give it to a rabbit. Um, these guys are s a lot smarter than we give them credit for, and they're more industrious than you would think. So be as creative as you can with their enrichment, and they will definitely appreciate it. Um, this is just a video of them kind of enjoying it. Everybody loves stuffed bag day because you just all you hear is I'm just ripping them to shreds, and um, we kind of call it a compassion fatigue exercise. If someone's having a bad day, we're like, go give the rabbit stuffed bags, because it's really rewarding to make something, give it to them, and see them instantly enjoy it. It's very gratifying. Um, and with so many rabbits, it's always an option. <laughs> you can always give them something and see them just instantly destroy it, instantly have fun with it. So it's, it's a, definitely a staff favorite. Um, food treats, obviously everybody enjoys. Um, make sure, like we had talked about before in the wild, they spend a large portion of their day foraging. So if you just hand them a carrot, the value in that is basically nothing. Um, make sure you provide this in a way that they have to work for it somehow. Um, just like you do with a primate, you can give them a foraging box or something, you know, something that they have to work for it somehow. You can give it to them fresh, frozen, or dried. Um, we do a lot of frozen treats with our rabbits just because they seem to enjoy them. Um, you can do various textures, smells. Um, we do food treats as the sole enrichment item only once per week, just so that they don't get too chubby. Um, but you can, uh, we mix them in with a lot of other things multiple times per week. So just be creative with every, like with everything else. Um, and then our last category is supplemental enrichment. Um, these are things that we don't provide as a sole enrichment item because we don't feel that they provide as much value, but we provide these um, in addition to our other enrichment items. So these are things like low volume instrumental music, white noise machines. Um, we actually started using that CD, that Pet Melodies, that's designed specifically for rabbits. Um, I don't know if they enjoy it more than any other classical CD, but our techs seem to enjoy it, and it's supposed to be designed specifically for rabbit enjoyment. So. I guess, maybe they like it. Um, we use everything on a timer for eight hours max, so if they don't enjoy it, they're not subjected to it for more than eight hours a day at absolute maximum. Um, we use grooming brushes, only if the rabbit appears um, to not be stressed by it. Um, some of our older guys in particular seem to really enjoy it. Um, so these are great things to use as supplemental enrichment. Um, and just to give a qu real quick example of some enrichment results. So this was, hopefully you can see it, this was a paired female who had gotten into a scuffle with her conspecific. And you can see she has some lesions on her ears and on her nose. So the only intervention that we did was to increase her enrichment to Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. After 11 days, you can see the lesions on her ears have completely healed. And the lesion on her nose is mostly healed. And then after 14 days, her ears are totally healed and her nose lesion is completely healed. And you can see that most of the fur has even grown back in on her nose. And the only thing that we did was increase her enrichment. So it really can be um, a really valuable tool. Um, just to give a real quick snapshot of how um, this has helped our colony um, maintain. So between 2016 and 2017, we've maintained 172 pairs. 62% of those have been female, 38% male. Um, I think those numbers would have been more even, except our colony in general is just more females than males. Um, only 8% of those had to be separated for fighting, and the average was 18 and a half weeks old. So that's right in that danger zone of 10 to 20 weeks, right where you would expect to see that happen. 20% um, of that 8% was male pairs. 
Um, our oldest male pair, however, was 75 weeks old, and our oldest female pair was 92 weeks old. Both of those pairs were separated only for lab use. I have full confidence that they would have gone on a lot longer because they were having no behavioral issues whatsoever. They, they were just, the lab needed them for their study. Um, so you can absolutely maintain males and females well into adulthood, well past sexual maturity. Um, some future directions for our program and hopefully some other programs as well. Um, I really think separate male and female rooms are kind of the way to go. Um, since sexual competition is the strongest form of motivational aggression. I know AbbVie's doing something with this. If anybody has any information on that, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. Um, we don't really have this luxury as a breeding colony, unfortunately. I'm trying to kind of work with this, but I really think this is would really help a lot of colonies if you're struggling with this. Um, and like I mentioned, since they are crepuscular, um, we are also hoping to get some infrared cameras and see what are they doing at dawn and dusk and at night when we're not watching them. I'm very curious to see what they're doing when we're not there. Um, and then we've done some uh, proof of concept studies into temperament testing um, that gave us some really interesting results. And so we're looking to develop some new temperament tests to um, further help optimize our uh, pairing, our attrition females. And then just some last kind of programmatic thoughts. Make sure you talk to your vendors. Um, we did a rabbit pairing workshop um, a couple months ago, and we had a vendor from Covance out, and he was very, I don't know what the word is, open to the thought of pair housing and ordering paired animals, including paired males. I know that we are very lucky to have um, a breeding colony to be able to obtain our males from, and not everybody has that luxury. Um, you can order paired males from your vendor. If your vendor is not willing to work with you, talk to another vendor, um, because we have to be kind of united in the fact that we need paired animals, and the vendors need to be willing to work with us to give us paired animals. And most of them are willing to work with us, as they should be. Um, and I know Covance is very open to it. Now we have to be reasonable with them and give them plenty of lead time and you know, be willing to work with them as well. Um, but make sure that you talk to your vendors about it, about getting um, paired animals shipped to you. And if they are just like, absolutely not, we're not willing to do that, talk to a new vendor because they really should be willing to work with you about it. Because um, we are all need to be on the same page about this. It's really, really vital. Um, and the more of us that are kind of on the same page, the more I don't want to say pressure, I don't want it to be like, you know, we're coming after them, but the more pressure we can put on them to really get them on the same page as we are um, so that we can all be, get this done. And then also, try not to listen to the scare tactics. Try to, if you have positive social housing rabbit stories, tell everybody about them because everybody has a negative story about rabbits social housing. And it scares people, and people always want to share their terrible stories, and people rarely want to share their positive stories. So if you have a positive story about rabbit social housing, tell everybody. Um, try not to listen to all the negative ones, because there's so many positive ones out there. Listen to those ones. Um, I know I had just listened to a YouTube talk that you gave, Karen, years ago, and you had talked about pairing males with such great success. And we need to get that story out more. Like, just don't listen to all the scare tactics out there. Listen to all these great positive stories that are out there. Um, don't, be so, don't be scared to do it at your institutions. I know I've talked to so many people that are really nervous about doing it. It absolutely can be done. It's being done. Um, just don't be, don't be scared. Don't listen to all the negative people out there about it. Um, and then as you go back to your facilities, just try and think about why we tolerate minor wounding in our other social species, but not rabbits. Um, I know we often get in pigs with you know, some scratches from social, socializations, and um, our primates will often you know, be rough and tumble, and they'll get scratches, and no one bats an eye. It's totally normal. But when a rabbit does it, everybody's up in arms, and we have to separate them, and everybody gets all upset. So just think about that. Why are we treating our rabbits differently than we're treating our pigs and our primates? And we really shouldn't be. So just. Kind of keep that in mind, um, because cosmetic imperfections like urine staining and superficial lesions are really a small price to pay for keeping um, properly socialized animals. Um, I have to thank these people that have been very, very instrumental in this process, um, in particular Lisa Burlingame and Jenny Lofgren. Um, we've done every bit of this from the very beginning together, and I couldn't have done any of this without them. 
if you are looking for um, better quality video than most of the ones that I took on my iPhone here. Um, we did publish an article in Jove last year. Um, we had an actual videographer come out, so the um, quality of video is much, much better. So if you're interested in that, it is in Jove. Um, and I know lots of us end our presentations with this, and I think this quote should be in every single presentation. It should be in every single break room, animal room, animal facility um, that we all do or work in um, because this could not sum up any better why we are all here, why we do the work that we do. Um, the quality, our quality of work is their quality of life. This is the most sacred privilege that we have, I think, and I think this sums up why we are here. So that is it. Thank you very much. I'm sure I ran over, so I look forward to talking to you all later. <laughs>